We're always wanting to structure our marketing in such a way that it makes business more profitable rather than just adding to the expense column. Profit often improves by focusing on the four main ways to grow a business. Those are increasing the efficiency of your processes, increasing the customer's average spend, increasing the number of times they buy from you, and by increasing the number of customers of the type you want. You can fit almost anything you can do to grow a business into these four categories. Welcome to the Digital Hive podcast where we talk all things marketing for creative small businesses. While most businesses just focus on expanding the number of customers, when you're working on all four options, you can really start to have a better balance because you're not just looking for new people all the time. Some businesses have seasons where it'd be common for a new business to become a client or for an online store to gain a large number of new customers, but you can see other revenue throughout the year when working on the other three categories as well and spreading the eggs into more baskets. As we go through this, it's not necessarily a list of things to add to your to-do list, it's more options you have to choose from, so you can add a little more variety or try something new and see how it goes when compared to what you've previously tried. The first route is to increase the efficiency of your processes. There's a limit to how much you would do this before you moved on to other initiatives, but to be able to produce more work with the same size team is one way to improve your profit while maintaining customer satisfaction and loyalty. Often this is done within the actual offer itself, but you can also work on efficiencies and return on investment with admin, legal, logistics, and other more stable areas of the business. These efficiencies might be found in all the areas you have communication between parties parties by cutting out the need to have meetings, having better information sharing systems, and by having checklists and processes to follow. Many businesses need a certain number of staff just to have someone with each type of expertise, but teams don't then scale in line with the rest of the business. This is why there's a whole market out there of virtual assistants and contractors, so you don't have to bring in employees before it's truly warranted. This is also why bigger companies will buy and essentially absorb other businesses and wrap the admin, management, board and legal into their own existing team, but buy the client list and bring in some of the team. In a recession or sometimes like that, people will sometimes cut their team size down because work is slowing. However, they can sometimes spot in hindsight where they could have or should have hired or managed differently. Maybe they could have cut down on the paperwork and fluff of the revenue generating team. Sometimes people only notice these efficiencies when a team is forced to do the same work with less people, but often they're too focused on just getting the work done by then to build the bridge as they're crossing it. This is why I like to look at it seasonally. However, there's a limit where working on trying to be more productive becomes unproductive. There's also striking a balance or a perfect ratio between the members of staff you have who work on billable and revenue generating work, both directly and indirectly, versus the non-revenue generating work. While increasing your efficiency impacts profit as you grow the other areas, you can also generate revenue faster when you're invoicing at the end of the project or in progress stages. For a product business, having quick shipping can increase your revenue because people are more likely to buy when they can have that quicker gratification than seeing a delayed shipping time and opting out of the purchase. We especially know that a slow dispatch can reduce the chances of people buying when they need something for a certain date, and it can be where the trust breaks down if it's not well communicated ahead of that purchase. As with everything, there's a balance between quantity and quality. I love a system and a process to better guarantee quality control or one that allows me to reduce the mental load and defer to something I wrote or created previously so I'm not reinventing the wheel. Eventually your templates can only get you so far, there's no more real optimization ground to gain and the work must begin. The second route is to increase your customer's average spend. You can generally do this by upselling extra items or services or raising the prices. In a service business, upselling might look like adding on new features for an additional price, like a website designer adding SEO work for a project. Retail and product businesses can often do this by selling a wider range of products for a similar customer. You might sell kitchen items where people need mixing bowls, spoons, spatulas, serving dishes, and so on. Rather than only selling cookbooks, you can branch out into fiction, non-fiction, and selling niche products. The same reader might not buy them all, but they might tell a friend or buy one as a gift. An accountant can offer bookkeeping services, a lawyer's office can cover multiple types of law, 
an office furniture seller can sell the desk, the chair, the bookcase, and a set of drawers. Since they're buying one thing, they might as well buy a few more while they're browsing. They might not buy a range on the first order, just to check you out for that one first time, but that doesn't mean that order number two isn't four times the spend now that they trust your quality. It sounds like common sense when you lay it out this simply, but this can be something that businesses skip over when they're being told to niche constantly. Plus, these are pretty simple examples. While you might not want to be a jack of all trades and master of none, remember that the rest of the saying goes, but oftentimes better than a master of one. Online stores can often raise the average spend with a free shipping amount that is slightly above a regular item. Say you sell varieties of the same item and you have free shipping when someone buys two of them or one in an accessory. You can also set that free shipping a little above the current average spend. To maintain profit, you'd want to be assuming most customers would get free shipping and have a certain amount of that absorbed into the price of products or limit free shipping to an area with lower costs for you. Another way is to do a multi-buy discount, like a buy two, get one half off, but this obviously means you're discounting the product, so it may not be the best for profit and should only be done sparingly if it's not something you're building into your pricing plan. You can also obviously raise the price. This can be done by changing your offer to include more value, so you can raise the price while also selling the same volume, or because of a supply and demand balance. I'm not talking about inflation and a normal yearly raise in pricing, since that wouldn't generate more profit, but a more transformative raise in pricing would. Rather than competing on price to be the cheapest or just as cheap as others in your industry, you can offer a variation of what they do so that those who want that extra value and are willing to pay for it know to come to you. The third route is to increase the number of times they buy from you. The simplest way would be to sell more products and services to the same clientele over time. This isn't always a good fit for every business, but there is some crossover with businesses who find it harder to raise the average spend is that the product can be bought somewhat regularly. I just spoke about upselling, but it doesn't always have to be an upfront add-on. You can often upsell once you have a client, but they now need something new. Regular communication is usually how you'll secure that work, so being in touch with them is not only good for word of mouth, but also for continuing to help them individually. This is sometimes possible with a lifestyle type of item or service. A cleaner might not always do a deep clean, but they can come every week or two. Someone who can get their foot in the door doing an end of tenancy or annual clean might be able to provide value to someone who would much prefer they come every month with a seasonal extra few hours or no seasonal clean at all. By creating or growing an offer that is regularly repurchasable, you can scale the lifetime value quite rapidly. This can be easily done when the product or service is something that they genuinely need or want more regularly, and by defaulting to the same product like a refill for the same soap, they can get that same consistent value with the convenience of making the decision once and rarely changing. Having product in stock or your availability for bookings is so key to this type of regular purchase since it might force them to choose an alternative and they might not switch back. If you're able to have people opt into a more recurring offer like a retainer or possibly even having them signed up on a subscription model, you can start to predict more of this revenue over time to be able to forecast your demand. I've been going to get facials regularly for a few years, which I started when my skin was quite sore. Rather than booking me in every month, I was on a membership plan. The payment was direct debited out of my account, and I rarely pulled my card out while I was actually there, unless I was buying skincare or upgraded a service for some reason as a once-off. They made a sale once and kept me on for years, rather than me constantly considering whether I needed to book in again. There's less effort on their end, but it's genuinely more helpful for me because I don't have to think about the payment and I can be booked months in advance. I worked for clients for years where I had them on a retainer. I didn't lock them into an annual contract, but they gave one month's notice to either pause or cancel. It was at my discretion too, so if they told me at the right time in the month, we just credited the invoice I'd just sent and stopped right away since they paid me in advance. But while I worked for them, I had already carved out time and planned ahead to work on their content or ads. A simple loyalty process can also help this, either with an explicit system where they receive something extra after a while, like a classic coffee shop loyalty card system, possibly with more tech behind it, or that they genuinely love what you do and stick around. I spoke about this much more in the marketing and sales funnel series I shared last year, so I'll link to that in the show notes. But this is the opposite of a churn and burn model where you only focus on the new one-time purchases, and in some cases don't even end up with word of mouth because the process isn't remarkable. 
The fourth route is to increase the number of customers of the type you want. And this is the route most choose while never really driving the other routes. New customers are great because they diversify the client or customer base, but they also bring in new revenue sources when a business doesn't always have a regular repurchase. Even with a subscription business, there is some level of churn where people will opt out after some time, but to continue to scale, you'll always need some new people. The reason we want more customers of a type you want is because your system's product offering or how you deliver the service is based on the needs of a type of customer. When you expand that without intentionality, you can waste time and effort making adjustments for them. And that isn't necessarily of any extra value to the customer, at least not to a point where they are paying for that time. This route is where the limits really come off and it just opens you up to all your marketing and sales options. How you bring in new people and then match their needs and expectations to convert them is completely up to you and where your unique marketing approach will come from. Your marketing could include people finding you from content, collaborations, advertising, networking or through word of mouth. You can also increase the chances of matching a customer's needs by expanding your options within the same niche. In services, this can look like offering three packages to choose from. If you're selling to wholesalers or are the type of product where people want to find the right one for them, it might also look like selling multiple varieties of the same product so their customers can choose between the options. If you made desks but had multiple sizes, colors, configurations, and standing and sitting desks, they can choose from the range instead of seeing the one desk and it not being a good fit. Your total numbers might not rise in line with how many products you have, like having three options might not triple the sales, but it can still serve more people. Working on these four ways in this order can mean that you can service your existing clientele first before expanding, and also that you can generate more revenue and in turn more profit from your new customers. There are always limits to the number of sales in any business at any one time, either because you can only restock so fast or deliver so many services at once with the team size you have. This is where the prioritizing comes in and it's just another balancing act to play either while you hire more team members or raise prices to meet that supply and demand without actually growing the team or working more yourself. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Digital Hive podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast, I'd truly appreciate it if you could share it with a friend or on Instagram and tag me at Honeypot Digital. To find out more about Honeypot Digital and the marketing strategy and coaching work I do, or to find more marketing resources, head to honeypotdigital.com.